And K is my nickname. You want to know my real name? Yes. Catherine. Oh. But it's spelled very differently. K T H R I N. Oh, my brother's girlfriend spells her name that way. Yeah, that is a really unique spelling. Yeah. I've messed it up before. That's how I know. <laughs> <laughs> So Kay, what we're going to do is I'm just going to ask you questions and we're just going to talk. So it's just like you and me, and, you, and you've done plenty of interviews, so you know how this goes. Well, that's what Bob did. Yeah. And so um, it's tempting to look at these guys when you're answering the question, but it's best if you just look at me when you answer the question. And then um, uh, if you could uh, answer in complete sentences. So um, we're going to take me out of the interview, so it'll just be you talking. So um, if, we, if I say, Kay, how old were you in the 1964 flood? You would say, I was. You Did better I figure that you? out first. <laughs> <laughs> you better so give just, me time to subtract. Just subtract 50. <laughs> just subtract 50. Subtract 50. 15. 15. 14. 14. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. I'll be 94 next month. Okay, so which would you rather be right now? Do you want to be 93 or 94? It doesn't matter. So you were 43. Oh, okay. There we go. We did the math. So um, just say I was 43 during the 1964 flood. Or actually, 44. You were 44 during the 1964 flood. It was Christmas today. Because it was Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, you would have already had your birthday by then. So, um, yeah, so we're, it's just going to be an easy conversation between the two of us. Um, anything, if you start to say something and you have to cough or something, you can just start that sentence all over again, and we can easily edit it. And um, we'll just uh, talk about things, and then if you feel like at the end you go, I never got to t the chance to tell a story about flying the meat into Crescent City, then I will stop and we'll let you <laughs> tell the fly the meat story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so we'll just kind of meander around, but you know, I've got your book here, Mandy, so I can refer to that and we can make sure that you tell all the stories that you want to tell. Well, unlike Les Pierce, I didn't lose, well, you know, he could have lost his life two or three times. I could have lost my leg twice. I think I had two horrendous times when it was dangerous, really downright dangerous. So we're going to start by just having you say and spell your name for us. My na you not? Are you not starting? Yeah, we're starting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My name is uh, Kay Gott Shafee, and I'm my. Uh, and I'm, what, 40, 43 when this flood hit. And uh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, it was 50 years ago. So somebody asked me how I could write a book. And I said, well, number one is I had my log book. And I hadn't planned to fly the flood. But there was an urgent need for commercial pilots. And I had a commercial license. And so when Mrs. Pierce called me, uh, I was uh, going to be an observer with a helicopter and just tell people where the Bennington came, the, Penny, the aircraft carrier, Bennington, <laughs> came and <laughs> brought all these soldiers that had never <laughs> never seen flood and, and didn't know what they were getting into and it was uh, cold they weren't dressed right uh, <laughs> and the first uh, helicopter was lost he missed the he missed the town of Eureka and he uh, his remains they crashed and his remains were found at Strawberry Rock, which is uh, inland a little bit. He missed the whole town of Eureka. And uh, I, at the time, I was living 
uh, close to the bay, Amok Bay, and I didn't hear him go over, but during the flood, I could hear the helicopters going over, and I would call Mrs. Pierce and say, here's another one coming, watch for it. But the weather was pretty awful. It was raining, and it was uh, snowing, and uh, you know, it was December, December weather. And uh, so when, on the radio, Keith and I both heard this. Um, he, he was born in Arcata, so he was prepared to do uh, navigation for these Bennington, Georgia <laughs> fellows that had never seen anything quite like this. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's hard to imagine like they're pilots and they're trained to being pilots, but you've never seen the terrain that you're now going to fly over. And it doesn't really matter if you did see it because it looks so different because it's mostly... Right, right. And after the, uh, or even during the flood, did I tell you how, how I how I happened to get involved in this. I hadn't planned to fly the flood. I really had not planned to fly the flood. I had planned to be, the radio called for observers to be with these Georgia men who had never been in this terrain before. So I said, okay, Keith, you go, because you know the area as w better than I do. and. Uh, so let's both go. We went out to Murrayfield, a little tiny airport, and volunteered. And uh, we sat there all morning, and nobody, nobody <laughs> called us. And so I looked at all the men were sitting around, uh, some 20 men, and uh, I'm the only lady in the group. So I go out and I count the helicopters <laughs> and, <laughs> and I say, come on, let's go home because there's more fellows here than, than there are helicopters. <laughs> and they all had a commercial license and they were prepared to observe with the, uh, with the helicopter guys. Just show them where to go you know, for the hospital, and uh, Eureka slopes up from the bay. So uh, it was pretty clear to us where they were needed. And, uh, well, we weren't called, so we went home. And on our way home, uh, there was a man from the TV station who stopped us and said, where have you been? And Mrs. Pierce heard him and she ran out the door and she says, I've been calling you for hours. Crescent City doesn't have a newspaper. They haven't had one for three days. You've got to go up to Crescent City and deliver three days worth of papers to Crescent City. And I said, oh, Hal, isn't this wonderful? I'm finally wanted. <laughs> Somebody wants me. <laughs> and so Keith went home. No, by then he'd found out that his parents needed him. And that'll show you in the letter. Yeah, well, we'll talk, let's talk, we'll talk about that in a little bit. We'll talk about what his parents needed help with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they were on the banks of the John, no, Smith River. They were on the bank, and they were evacuated at 3 o'clock in the morning in the dark. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Three inches of soot, not soot, sand on the kitchen floor. Oh, I didn't want to clean that up. <laughs> we went up and dug mud and cleaned up the stuff out of the kitchen, and he lost. The only thing that he saved was interesting. This would be interesting. I don't think this is in the book. He hadn't been able to get his car out of the garage. And the weight of his car held the garage where it was on the banks of the Smith River. And of course the garage was completely devoid of paint on the upriver side. As the stones came down, they really took the paint off 
side of his garage. Wow, that's amazing. Just one side. Are you guys okay with the sound? Is the sound sounding okay? Are we having any issues with that? It's bouncing up and down pretty good, but I think it's okay. Okay, I just wanted to check and make sure the sound was good and make sure your mic still sounds Okay. Because I noticed it's like, it is now pointing. He's right. That, I'm going to turn that the other way around and see if I can get that going the other way. It's just funny how like that just doesn't work. On the kitchen on the floor. Kitchen floor. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but the car held the garage floor down and kept the garage from sliding down. <laughs> Were they able to um, to clean that up and keep that building at all? Your job. Yeah. You tell me about that, because I'm sure a lot of women were stuck. A lot of women weren't pilots during the flood, but a lot of women were stuck cleaning up some of those messes. How'd you get all the mud and everything out of the... Shovel. We shoveled. And I, we had a Volkswagen van at the time. And so to go to Ferndale, uh, I think I write this in the book, we took a busload of kids and we washed windows, we cleaned yards up. Uh, we could not rescue the Davenports and the overstuffed furniture. It was smelly and mildewed and full of Debris. <laughs> now, were these your college students in your classes at HSU? Oh, okay. How did you get them all riled up to do this? Well, I didn't at first because they were out. School was out. That's how I was able to do all this. It, it was the first day of December. No, Christmas Eve. It was Christmas night when the crest hit and took out all the bridges. And I said in my book that it was uh, 53, no, 33 bridges, but it turned out Dave Zebo corrected me. He said, Kay, you missed like Dinsmore Bridge and you missed a lot of bridges. So it's 52 bridges went out. So we were pretty isolated. Yeah, those college students, now were they all able to get out of the area? No, uh, the ones that uh, were trapped had post office jobs, like giving Christmas mail out. And uh, the ones that got out, some of them only got as far as trees of, no, not trees of mystery. Uh, what's the one south? Confusion Hill? Confusion well, Hill or, um... yeah, down by Richardson's Grove. They got trapped down there because uh, <laughs> it got pretty awful after a while because they ran out of food. But the interesting thing at Oric, uh, Gene Haygood's family had a interest in the little grocery store. So she, she fed 75 people on that day, the Christmas day. And how they saved the bridge at Oric, they got a grabber and took the lugs over and let them go down the river. They ended up on the beaches. And you know, I got bawled out by one of the high school guys whose wife 
also flew, but she didn't fly during the flood. But he said to me, um, you did a terrible thing uh, going out to sea. And I said, why? I couldn't have landed on the, on the beach anyway. The beach was full of logs from the Klamath River coming down. Uh, where, where, where could I have landed? Well, the highway. I finally landed on the highway. Where on the highway did you end up landing? Well, south of uh, Oric is this straight stretch, and I landed there once. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I mostly just, uh, you could see the squalls. The rain was uh, really contained in a, in a special place, and you could see the edge of it. So I <laughs> said to one of my passengers, do you mind if I go out to sea? And he said, Lady, you're the pilot. So I went out to sea, went around the squall, and back into Crescent City. But Crescent City was really bad. The, the picture I have in my book shows the Angus bull that crept. I don't know how he got up on top of the logs, but he came down the Klamath River on top of the log deck. He, um, he came from Klamath Glen. Klamath Glen, yeah. right. Did they ever find the I, owner? Well, you know, I think they did, but I think they also decided that that bull never had to be, like his, the intention was that he was going to be eaten, like originally. Oh. But since he survived all that, they let him live to a ripe old age. I mean, he lived for a really, really, really long time. Great. He well taken care of. <laughs> he, he earned it. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, that, was rough, that was a rough trip for him. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, the whole harbor was just logs. Yeah. yeah. I've heard that um, it really caused problems for the fishing fleet out of there. Oh yes, they were they were trapped. They really were trapped. And it was after that that they got those uh, uh like jacks jack straws or jack women's Oh, we used to play jacks with the, they were pronged. Oh, uh, yeah, the pylons. The, the um, pylons were pronged. Yeah. So they wouldn't, uh, if they got hit, they would just go to another prong. Yeah, they're, they're, they're dolos, I think is what they call those. Yeah, dolos, yeah. Like a, but they, um, weren't, they weren't built until after the flood. Oh, okay. So they did that to save the harbor. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. And you got to actually see some of that debris from the airplane. I saw that it was impossible to land on the on the ocean front anywhere because it was just full of debris, logs and milled lumber. And I said, "Where's all this coming from?" Well, Myers Flat had a big mill. And they lost the whole thing. It was on a bend of the med. And then and Scotia lost their log deck as well. Yeah, they lost their log deck. And the Eel River was the worst. Yeah. Did you ever see any of the burning, like after the flood, them burning some of these log piles on the beach? I've heard people talk about that. Uh, I didn't see it because uh, I had to go back to school and teach after the, <laughs> but the, the aftermath was terrible. Mud everywhere and logs and uh, they got tractors to bring the, but the tractors got mired in the mud. And I watched them bury the cows, the several ranchers lost their herd it was one rancher that had the foresight to have an alternate place, and he took them up on a higher land. Lolita, Lolita was just flattened. Yeah. So you got you saw them out there with the machines digging and burying some of the cattle. Yeah, they they did a big trench on the south spit, and just uh, dumped the bloated cows in there, <laughs> the dairy herds. Yeah, they lost a lot of cattle. Um, can you tell me about the um, 
me a little bit about Helen and Les Pierce, what they were like? Oh, uh, Les was very, uh, very wonderful to me. Uh, he, you know, I hadn't flown for a while and I had been flying a few years just before the flood. So I had renewed my license, but he, uh, he said, Kay, you haven't flown in this kind of weather. And I said, no, I never have, because the Army wouldn't let us, uh, wouldn't let us out in this wet kind of weather. <laughs> but I was so glad I had an instrument rating. And I, I was only scared after. <laughs> I had one horrible fright trying to get over to Ukiah and the snow and the ice slid off the wing, and then I was scared. <laughs> but it was after the fact. <laughs> yeah, it, that's good that you were able to kind of recover in, in time yeah, to, yeah. Um, to deal with all that, gosh. And so that was, um, I think reading your book, it sounded like that might have been when you were flying into Noyo Harbor area in Mendocino, and then you had some icing on your wings. And we were wondering what rime ice is. Rime ice is clear, and they were about the 50, 50 cent size, and I had never seen rime ice before. And uh, I was going to Sacramento with that, with a uh, private pilot license fellow and his family uh, to get back, and he left his airplane at um, Murray Field and came back for in better days. <laughs> I never saw him again after that. But I said, when we went into Sacramento, would you please handle the radio? <laughs> and he said, yes, he would. So he was co-pilot for me. <laughs> so you, you were probably like, you know, that's a different airport than you're used to going into. And right. you're, you're probably just used to knowing everybody on the other end of the radio. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So Helen and Les Pierce, um, what was Helen's role with their business? Helen was a dispatcher at Humboldt, and she said she held her breath every time I went out that I would get back safely. <laughs> but I, I, um, it didn't bother me to fly the Silver Ribbon. You know, that was the beach. And, but it was covered with, I knew there was no alternate place to land. And it didn't, it didn't phase me. Uh, and some people have said, how can you remember things so far back? I said, boy, it was pretty vivid at the time. <laughs> it stayed with me <laughs> because uh, it was so unusual. Yeah. Well, I think just, you know, some of your experience about getting your, um, how you became a pilot in the first place. I mean, you had to do things that were very unusual, and that probably... Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, I had a couple of scary times, but I got out of them, you know. It, <laughs> it happens, and I it was... When pilots tell you that they've never been lost, <laughs> they're either lying or <laughs> they're exaggerating some way, <laughs> uh, momentarily confused, and when... Mrs. Pierce asked me if I would take this fellow into Willow Creek. I said, well, yes. I, I knew there was a landing strip there. It's not there anymore. In fact, it didn't last very long. It was right on the sandy beach, and it was pretty short, but I figured I could get in there all right. Other people had, I knew. But uh, when I got over Chesham's Ranch, that was the last thing I could see. And I said, I'm not going to go into the mountains blind because the fog was pretty bad and it was snowing pretty hard. And I said, I'm going to turn around and go home. <laughs> and, and if Bud wants to get to Willow Creek, I'll see if there's a car available and if there's a road open, <laughs> you go by, by road. <laughs> you lived to 93 is you made these smart decisions along the way. Well, I had to do it more than once. <laughs> I think that's good. And you have to do it instantly, you know. You have to make up your mind. You can't mull it over. <laughs> you have to decide, 
go or or come back. What did you teach at Humboldt State? I started in physical education. I had one class of dance, and the first I I can tell you this because I got I was reprimanded. I had twins, twin girls in my class, and very shyly they came up after class and said we don't do the dances that way. And I said, what did I do wrong? Well, they said, that, well, it isn't wrong, but it's, we, California had just founded the Federation, 1948. They had founded the California Folk Dance Federation. And so they standardized some dances so that because people could do festivals and not hit each other. And there's one dance a very famous dance called Troika Three, and it's Russian, and you run forward and you go run back. Well, instead of running back, you run sideways, and then you go in, you do a V thing, and then you don't crash into the person behind you. <laughs> so uh, it's modifying some of the dances to make them festival dances, so hundreds of people could dance. And I've seen maybe a thousand people dance uh, in Salt Lake City. The Mormons had a dance program and they would dance in the stadium, the football stadium, and cover the football stadium. And I said, well, this is possible if you modify some of the dances like running forward and backward Right. <laughs> so, tell me about um, just going back in time about you getting your pilot's license initially. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Well, um, we were depression people. We didn't have any money. And we lived with my grandparents. And there were eight people in the family. And uh, my grandfather made sure that everybody got fed every day. He would. Do you remember the wheel cheeses? Yeah, I love the wheel cheeses. Okay, <laughs> I don't see them anymore. <laughs> yeah, he would cut a, a slice, and there's a famous recipe called Welt Rarebit, and it's mostly milk and a little bit of cheese, and you made a mixture. And if you had money, you put it on toast. And if you didn't have money, you put it on crackers because <laughs> they were cheaper. <laughs> and we lived a lot on Wolf's Rabbit. And then, and then when did you um, get, end up getting involved with the military to get your pilot's license? Well, I was the... You'll have to read my other book. <laughs> I, I had to write... I had to write how I got into flying because with no money, uh, flying is expensive and it's expensive to learn, uh, but the uh, government started a program called Civilian Pilot Training and I was a sophomore in the college when I found out about the program, so I enrolled with 19 boys. And let me tell you, if you don't think women ever get intimidated, I never opened my mouth for the whole semester. And hence, I didn't... Mike's there. Oh, I didn't... Un <laughs> Is it okay now? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I didn't understand carburation because I we never had we didn't have a car. And I didn't understand vectors because I never had physics. Uh, I didn't understand um, a lot of navigation aids. Uh, yeah, I didn't. So I failed my first written. I failed that. And uh, they were questions like this. With A, B, C, D, four choices. And so the most logical ones were the two center ones. <laughs> and, and so I tried to bluff my way through the test and I, and I failed. 
Uh, so my mother was furious because my mother was a math teacher and she became a math teacher because of this. She said, I will teeter, tutor my daughter if you will give me or tell me where I can get the books that you're using for the text. So we got on the Greyhound bus and we went to 10 miles away to the college and she got the books. And then a month later, I flew myself down to Twin Falls, took the test again and passed. <laughs> and uh, the instructor, by that time, Pearl Harbor had happened. And uh, the program was closed to women, completely closed to women. So I went to the instructor in Boise, uh, Boise, which is now Boise Junior College. And the airport was right beside the river. And I asked Mr. Rice if he would let me sit in with the boys. And the boys, uh, they were from New Plymouth and Pat and different areas besides Nampa, but they would stop and pick me up. And my job, we had a touring car. The, one of the boys had a touring car, and my job was to hold the roof down because it was canvas, and it would flop up <laughs> every time we went down a hill. <laughs> so um, that's how I got my commercial uh, instruction, by going to their class in Boise. And it sounds like the guys, they accepted you. Well, uh, at first nobody talked to me, which is all right, because I didn't talk to anybody else. I was the last one in the room, and I was in the last seat, <laughs> closest to the door, <laughs> and I op never opened my mouth the whole time. Hence, I didn't understand anything, and when I didn't understand, I said, okay, read, read the book. <laughs> and learn it from the book, but it was impossible. So when my mother tutored me, uh, she became very interested in the program and eventually earned her master's degree in mathematics. And what I did, I got hold of an E6B and any mathematics teacher would know what I'm talking about. It's a computer, but it's circular. It was American Airlines circular slide rule. And it would tell you, uh, if you dialed it right, uh, distance, fuel consumption, wind, uh, time. And I carried it for two years and 11 days around my neck on a string. <laughs> and every night, my mother doesn't, my mother didn't believe me. When I got to South Bend, Indiana, my relatives were there and I didn't call them up and say, hi, this is Kay. Uh, I, I was doing my homework. I was plotting next, next day's trip where I needed to get fuel it depended on what I was flying, and... Uh, so did you fly a lot of different aircraft? Oh, by the time I finished two years and 11 days, I had flown 17 different types. Within the type, there were two or three models. Uh, I had flown a lot of different things. So when the flood came, I got a chance to fly everything on the field in the eight days that I worked. I had never flown a pusher <laughs> and, and I got to fly at to Sacramento and I on the trip to Portland, I never made it to Portland. I made it as far as Depot Bay and Newport and I landed and said to the operator that I, I wasn't gonna go into the soup I, w I needed to be VFR the whole way and 
I turned around at some river uh, and I said, I'm not going to go under that. I'm not, you can't go over it. I'm going to turn around and go back. So I did. <laughs> so I'm here today. <laughs> I think you made some good decisions. Um, can you tell me a little bit about Dave Zebo? Oh, sure. He was my hero. He was uh, a safety officer uh, with the CHP, California State Highway Patrol. And I, when I first went to Humboldt, uh, when I, the first thing I did practically was to take a first aid class with him. Very good class, and I respected him very much. And then when he got the job of Humboldt County Director of Aviation, I uh, even respected him more because he would go out to Dinsmore and these faraway ranches and drop food and drop uh, uh, necessities with a yellow ribbon so they could find us, you know. Oh, there was okay. quite a wind and the wind was terrible. No, I think we're going to stop this for a second because there's a helicopter outside. Yes, I hear it. <laughs> so we're going to give that helicopter a chance to figure out where they're going and then well, pick back up. Well, sometimes they would, there's a helicopter station over that way. I was wondering about that, yeah. yeah. Wow, it sounds like they're going to fly right on top of the building here. Well, let me take this thing off. I got to go to the bathroom. Oh, let me get you. This is a yeah. This would be a good chance to go. Oh, you. I, I think you can keep that on. I think I'm just going to take your uh, this off and then let you get going. Get you um, your walker here. Walker. Where did I do? Oh, do you think it's back in your room? Yeah. Do you think can I you, need it? Can you hear me when I'm talking? Do you think you'll be able to hear me? Yeah, so when I, I ask the question, you. that's the important thing. I think so. You have to listen to the sky. I'll say what? <laughs> Just say what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? 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 Uh, when Al flies me from Arcata, he has a, or he had a twin engine Seneca Piper. Uh huh. And uh, one time, he had a tailwind, and it took him 51 minutes to come oh. from Murrayfield here. I would have liked to have done that today. <laughs> I know, it's quite a trip. Here we go. Click. Can you go a little lower? Okay, how's the light? Make you look as good as possible. <laughs> you look good. So let's see. We were talking a little bit about Dave Zebo. Oh yes, yeah, my hero. <laughs> yeah. He was. What, what was his role during as the aviation officer during the flood? Uh. Hmm. His job. He went out to the outlaying areas with a package of food usually uh, and drop, dropped it to these places that didn't have a, like uh, Bridgeville, Dinsmore, um, Burnt Ranch. See, all the rivers were raging, 
There, the flood was on the west side of the Rockies, from Canada to Mexico. That enormous nine-foot tide, snow every day, rain, hail, sleet, rye mice. <laughs> The weather was just miserable. So the rye mice, was that something that would form on the airplane? No, I was flying a 310 at that time. And uh, they said, aren't you lucky you have a airplane that <laughs> won't, won't be bothered by rye mice? And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> I'm very grateful. <laughs> what was it about the plane that made it so that it wasn't affected by that? Uh, I think it, it was the engine, and I'm not an engineer, and I can't tell you what the engine was, but a 310 is... Oops, I think you're hitting the microphone there. Oh. There we go. Did I? Okay. It's okay. It's when you touch it, it makes scratchy noises. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, it wasn't, the engine wasn't affected by the rye mice. I just flew right through it. <laughs> and I didn't want to go over Mount Tom, which was the highest mountain between us and Sacramento. Uh, and the fellows that fly out of Klamath Falls here, uh, I see them come from Bend. Uh, I see the ones come letting down from Hawaii to Seattle. Sometimes I see their contrails. But there's an active unit in uh, Klamath Falls, and I met one of the ladies that flew with them. One. I met one. <laughs> yeah, you were in a field that was pretty male-dominated, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yes. But you found your way through that. You found a way to make friends and... Well, <laughs> let me tell you. You pick up a 51 in where it's made, take, take to Newark, New Jersey, where they take it apart and put the wings on the deck of the ship and zigzag their way through the wolf pack uh, it's a lonesome job. You're all by yourself. You can't wait for anybody. You're not supposed to wait for anybody. You have to be off at 8 in the morning. And you have to be down half hour before sunset. It's a pretty lone, lonely life. It's got to be. And so when you say you can't wait for anybody, that would be your other uh, people who are ferrying aircraft. Is that right? Well, we, we, didn't, we didn't go in bunches. And I found out as I was writing my book on women in pursuit who flew the fighters uh, that Romulus didn't have this rule. And so they, especially in training, flying training plans, we flew in a clump. Not formation flying, but we kept track of where each one is. I did that for a year before I went to pursuit school. Wow. Most women had a year in training planes before they went to pursuit school. And I was very fortunate because I got to go to Palm Springs pursuit school before it was closed. And it wasn't really closed. It was made a... a stopover base to get the planes out of foggy Los Angeles. Into the nice sunny desert. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you had a lot of up, uh, you know, a lot of heat rising making your that a rocky ride. Was it a little bit rough? Some days. Yeah, some days, yeah. But you found an altitude that yeah. was better. So um, tell me a little bit more about the stories about flying in the flood. Um, some of the trips that you had to make and what they were like. Uh, 
I should tell you about uh, the farm couple because they, she was in Murrayfield weeping, just sobbing away and crying and she didn't have a handkerchief and I had a clean handkerchief somewhere so I hauled it out and I went over where she was sitting and crying and <laughs> really having a terrible time. And I said, what's the matter? Can I help you? And she said, my husband wouldn't let me go back. She was from Pepperwood. And he wouldn't let her go back to get her wedding ring. I said, of all things. <laughs> <laughs> no, what happened? <laughs> no, he was, uh, they were both evacuated by somebody else, not me. And I met them in Murray Field and took them. I flew them, finally. He said, Lady Pilot, okay, finally, after I had comforted her <laughs> and given her a handkerchief. <laughs> and so after the uh, crisis was over, they were Red Cross relocated them in Rio Dale. You know where Bellevue is? Yeah. Okay. So she, I got this telephone call one night. Would you like to come to dinner? Who is this? <laughs> where do you live? <laughs> and, and she made this horrendous recipe for us. And Floyd Batiga, have you ever met him? I've heard the name. Okay, Floyd Batiga was also invited. And uh, so I bought a bottle of wine or we, we took something. We must have taken wine because they're Italian people. And uh, She spent the evening, or before we ate, she spent the night bawling him out because he was supposed to stir the polenta to melt the cheese. And I got hold of the, <laughs> when I wrote the book, I got hold of the chefs here and said, tell me about the cheese because they were, it was very special cheese. And they finally decided it was a combination of Asiago and uh, I forget what else. Maybe a Parmesan. I'm sure Parmesan was yeah. in it. Yeah. When I was in Parma, I said, <laughs> this is where the cheese came from. <laughs> That's great. So uh, tell me about the, well, you had to fly some meat. Oh, that was, uh, that was wildly exciting. That's another place where I, it was that close to being a disaster. 1,400 pounds of meat, nobody weighed it, nobody said you're overloading the plane, nobody, I mean, it was just uh, one of the things that you did. They took the seat out and uh, put all this 1,400 pounds of meat. <laughs> I can't believe it today that I did that. But, you know, the plane took off and I get to Crescent City and there's two inches of snow. And I said, oh my God, the guy before me ground looped because his tracks were in the, in the snow. And I said, if you overshoot the runway, you're going to go over the cliff because the north-south runway is <laughs> that way and so how are you going to do it well drag it in as slow as just keep it above stalling and drag it in a long way and then chop the engine right at the end of the runway and I did it <laughs> and I think today my god <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think I was brave. I, I was just doing my job. Yeah, I think 
just those reactions of, okay, I've got to do this, and what's the best choice? But I look back on it and I say, God, did I have nerve? <laughs> no, I had a job and it was to be done and I was the one to do it. Well, I think you, you're you one of those women that helped pave the way for all the rest of us, you know? It's well, like, I succeeded. Yep. And uh, that's the main thing. Yeah. I'm here today. Um, one of the things that you talked about in your book was that they didn't allow civilian airport air pilots to fly at first. That's why I got the Sacramento trip. Uh, this fellow came in with a private license and his family, I don't know, two or three kids. And uh, they wouldn't let him off the field. And he says, I have to get home. I have a business to run in Sacramento. And uh, one of the guys said, well, get Kay to take you. And I had not been to Sacramento before, ever. And when I landed, uh, I think Alma Hines was the operator, the, the owner and the operator, and the airport was west of the town. Now it's east of the town and a long, long runway. And uh, <laughs> I made it in. <laughs> Yeah. And, and so um, that was, uh, so it was, uh, actually it was, um, so civilian pilots being private license, so you had a commercial license. I had a commercial license and an instrument rating. And if you get one today, it's about $5,000. It was about $5,000 because I wanted to renew my license at Troutdale. And I inquired to do that. And it was over $5,000. Plus, the reason I didn't do it, I never did it, um, where was I going to live? And what was I going to live off from? <laughs> I didn't have a job. <laughs> you know what I'm, I think I'm going to do is I think I'm going to move that mic um, just up on the sleeve there because I'm thinking it's just... You are like me. You talk with your hands, and that's okay. But I just want to keep this thing out of your range there, just so it's not going to mess with you. Okay. Are you getting tired? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, could you talk a little bit about why it's hard to fly um, in a storm? Well, why is it hard to fly? Um, in a storm like you had at the 64 flood? What was it, you know, as a pilot, what are you seeing and what do you hear and what's it like? Well, I didn't like to fly through hail and so I landed. Uh, I got, uh, I came back from a trip and I landed. I had passengers. I had that boy and girl with a dog and I landed in Samoa and there's a drag strip for automobiles there. And um, so I just sat in the plane and I said, these squalls are, the wind is pretty, pretty consistent and it will take the squall away. So let's just sit here and, and wait it out. And we, that's what we did. But I turned the engine off, but there was a guy next to me. He landed and turned the engine off, I think. I can't remember whether you did or not. But anyway, I turned it off and they just sat there and with the rain, rain pelting down and it pretty soon it quit. And then I went on to Murray Field. What's it like when you're in the air and you, and you have, you're going into a squall? What's it like to fly a plane in a squall? Oh, it's rough. <laughs> uh, the wind currents are rough. make it pretty rough. I would avoid a squall, but I, I was in a passenger in a B-17 once, and a fellow went through a front, a, a weather front, where the cold air meets the bad air, and the <coughs> stoop flew right through it, and uh, he had passengers besides me. I was hooking a ride. 
<laughs> you know, if you go into some place like Great Falls, how are you going to get home? One airline a day? <laughs> you going to wait another day to get an airline home? Well, <laughs> here's a B-17 sitting there. Where are you going? Dallas. And then you had to figure out how to you just kind of work your way back? Just one, hit, one hitched right at a time? Well, uh, they made a movie after, after this uh, war was over called The Best Years of Our Lives. And there was so much demand for it that they reissued it. I have it on a DVD now. And it's three service people coming home with different experiences. And it's so good. I'm writing it down. Yeah, best years of our lives. The banana, <laughs> flying banana, <laughs> yes. They painted it yellow. And what happened after the flood? How are we gonna get any students home, back to the college, from home back to the college? And so our Dean of Students had the bright idea of broadcasting that Pacific Airlines, if they would land in Reading, he would fly them at a reduced, I'm sure he got something out of it, a reduced rate, fly them back to Humboldt. And so they did that. Hundreds of kids did that, especially the ones that had jobs. They had to get back. Back to their job. Uh, I had a, um, a photograph of myself on my belt, and you had to show that to get on the field because there was so much demand for people were stranded. They really were stranded. Seems like they had to distinguish between people who worked for the press who wanted to take pictures and people who needed help instantly. Well, this television man that I, uh, he lost, he lost his, no, no. He was trying to interview Bunny Hadley. And I had his daughter in one of my classes and uh, he just disappeared. And they kind of figured afterward, they found one of the wheels and with part of his name on it. But he was lost in the flood, and money never was found. And so, yeah, so they were able to um, just make sure that people who needed to be flying were flying, and so not just the, the news crew. Well, what do you think about um, Humboldt County had a lot, or Humboldt, Del Norte, Siskiyou, all those counties there were pretty rural. A lot of people work with their hands. They did uh, logging or fishing or you know things like that. We're really good at problem solving, and we're wondering if that helped that the outcome wasn't as bad as it could have been. Not that many <laughs> lives were lost. I mean, maybe maybe they're just tougher folk. I don't if know. you go down to Eureka today, there's a big Caltrans building, beautiful big building, and at the time of the flood. They saved Eureka. I said, well, what were we doing? <laughs> the building wasn't there during the flood. That's right, and people, people just stepped up and did what they needed to do. A lot of the right. private owners of you know, Caterpillar tractors were in there moving dirt. And I had to give a big hand to the uh, did dot, did dot, did dash men who worked uh, ham radio, they kept us in touch 
with the outside world because eventually all the telegraph poles went down in the bud and uh, the radio was out. He that just, was it. That, that was, was it. Yeah. They, they kept us in touch. And another interesting thing that Dave Zebo did, um, in Ferndale, they have a fairgrounds. And right next to the fairgrounds is the way to get into the fairgrounds. It's, it's a sloping, sloping downhill thing. And he would land uphill on this thing and, and deliver messages and whatever they needed. Ferndale was pretty isolated. Yeah, and people, it sounded like, you know, the fairgrounds were, was a place where people brought their cattle, if their cattle were still alive, and they... Uh, it wasn't so off. good to bring your cows there because the, it was really a place for the fair animals, not the whole herd. Oh. So it wasn't, wasn't that good a place. But there were some places there. But the fairgrounds were, uh, were pretty well out of the flood. And, and uh, was a refugee center for a lot of people who were displaced. Well, uh, what they did was um, call for cots and set up cots for people to sleep in the fairgrounds. So did people brought those from their homes and, and brought them down there so people would have a place to sleep? And they had kitchens where people could cook. And of course, they, at the fair, they always fed people. So they had stoves big enough to handle the mob. We also heard like people, you know, who had freezers, you know, they... Oh, they lost, so they, they lost, lost food. <laughs> they lost their food yeah. <laughs> because the electricity went off. Yeah. But Sears and Montgomery Wards and, uh, the county was marvelous afterwards because the county health people published and Xeroxed how you would fix like the fireplace uh, and irons and how you wash the windows and uh, made them <laughs> see through them all. <laughs> so how to clean up after? They, they yeah, they, they, they did a wonderful job, and we took, uh, we had this van, so we took college kids out in Ferndale and washed windows forever, <laughs> and uh, what, what, what could you do with the overstuffed Davenports except just pile them up, and I think eventually they were burned, because they smell terrible. No, you can't, no. you can't really save over stuff furniture. So your college students, did they, um, did you feel they got something really good out of being able to go and help people? Oh, I think so. I think it was a, a relief, really. And some of the college kids that were uh, stranded at Tea Garden until, which is a place where they were trying to get out of, <laughs> they're right on the banks of the Eel River and uh, they ran out of food. And that was a, that was a ration thing. <laughs> yeah, it's good to experience that, I think, at least once in your lifetime to experience what you like Yeah, yeah. But we, we always had, we always had food where I was. And I answered the telephone. That was the interesting thing. They put me on, Mrs. Uh, um, I can't even think of her name, but it's in the book. She put me on the telephone, and I thought I knew I had lived in Eureka for a while, and it's full of canyons. <laughs> and you get to the end of one street, and there's a canyon, and you have to go back, backtrack, and then go around the canyon to get it's, where you... It is still like that in Eureka. It's still... Yeah, it's still like that, where you have a street, and then it stops, and then you have to go around, and then the street starts again, and yeah, it's hard to Well, after one experience of being frustrated like that, she took me off the telephone and put me on something else. 
One woman called, I'm in Germany and I see on the television that you, the town is floating away. And I said, relax, the town is not floating away. <laughs> Eureka's high and dry. <laughs> I know, it's like that when you hear about a disaster anywhere and you know anybody who lives anywhere close to it, you think, oh my God, what's yeah, happening yeah. to them? Yeah, she was Panicsville. Yeah. But, uh, but it sounds like the community really came together and you know people opened up their homes for refugees and um, helped them you know, while they made arrangements, made more long-term arrangements. It sounds like the community really came together supported each other. I think so. And uh, Zebo is part of this uh, outlying place. Uh, making packages, mostly food. They were running out of food and ranches. And uh, when the electricity went off, which it did all, all over the West, you had to make do with things that were not so perishable. But we were warned not to, not, not to use canned things. And I said, isn't that interesting? Well, I think it's the, um, when they get wet. Yeah. Things happen to those cans, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this is great. Does anybody else have any other questions that, any other questions? I'd like to hear how risky you thought it was taking the dog on the, the an unknown dog on your, your plane. Oh, yes. I, you can look at yeah, yeah. yeah, I was uh, afraid he was going to jump around and, and really disrupt the flying part. Uh -huh. And uh, the owner, these two college kids, assured me he was docile, and I petted him, and he let me pet him. And the fellow says, I'll keep the lace, the leash. I'll hold on to it the whole time. We put him in the back seat, and he behaved. And I got <laughs> uh, Jesse Faulkner of the Humboldt Times Standard really criticized me because I, I needed to edit that book one more time, but I, but I couldn't get hold of the person that was going to do it. And uh, so it, it's, it's repetitious. I think I have an incident with a dog twice. <laughs> dog made an impression in your mind, I think. Well, I had never flown a dog before. And they can jump around. And when I fly with Al and we come, do you know where Jacksonville is? Yeah. This is a good time to see where the slot is. Uh, there's a factory right, right by where the two mountains overlap. Oh, sure. All right. That, that's where he comes in. That's the closest place. And he starts to let down right, right about there. And the airport is over there, five miles from, from me right now. And uh, 51 minutes. 51 minutes. That sounds like a bargain to only drive for 51 minutes. Took us about six hours. Okay, yeah. At least six <laughs> hours. If you, if you don't stop, I have to stop and pee. <laughs> well, we're going back. We're going uh, the other way to go back. We're going uh, Highway 96, and we're going to stop in Happy Camp and do an interview in Happy Camp. Ah, yes. So we're doing the circuitous route going back for sure. Well, I did have one, one incident at Happy Camp. Yeah? Uh, Dailies. Dailies had little packets a small package, about this big, that I was to take to Happy Camp. The whole, I think the whole lumbering operation closed down until they got the piece back. It was something in the, in the lumbering industry, in the mill. <laughs> but I got there, and now, today, uh, some of the residents here fly. We have a couple, and uh, one guy lost his life right at Happy Camp because the mountains come just like that, down to the Klamath River. Wow. 
and his records, the bass playing, was strewn all over the south side of the mountain. And he lost his life. Yeah. But his widow still lives here. Well, yeah, dangerous flying. And well, it was a storm again. And I think you don't play with storms an awful lot in the mountains. You try to stay out of them. <laughs>